turned on the brakes, jumped out, and far off in the distance you could see someone coming through a field with a stick, slowly coming. And he was running toward her, and she, then she dropped her stick, and then by the time I got to them, she, they were on the ground and she was singing him lullabies. It was very sweet. But at the same time in Korea, I noticed my left arm and my left leg were feeling very heavy. And after coming back to the States and going from doctor to doctor, I've discovered I have Parkinson's. Um, I do not have the shaking palsy that so many have, but I have lost some of my balance. I'm walking four miles a day. I am wringing out wet towels. I am wadding up newspapers and trying to make my hands strong. I feel like I've been born in the right century, in the right decade even, in the right months, because Dr. Irving Cooper is going to operate on my brain. And Izzy, my colleague from life, Alfred Eisenstadt, is going to photograph all of my exercises and my operation. You know, I wasn't going to do that. I mean, it's a private affair, but, um, but that's what Life Magazine does. You know, we tell the story so other people will know. So um, <laughs> well-meaning friends ask me, why are you doing all this, going to all this trouble? I said, well, it's what I always did in my career. The highest praise I ever got from my editors was, Maggie won't take no for an answer, and I won't. So what I want you to do is keep up your subscriptions to life, and then you'll be able to read the whole story. And thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. to think about now, and I will certainly answer questions if you'd like. I also would like to say thank you to the New Hampshire Humanities Council. They have brought me to, for about 13 years, first as Susan B. Anthony and now this. They are so grand. Uh, I even live in Massachusetts, but I still send them money. <laughs> so they're just, it's amazing. It's so much easier up here. All of your towns are having something all the time. Rest of the story. <laughs> well, she had an operation in 1959, and that didn't do too much. And then on one side of the brain, and on the other side of the brain, she had an operation, I think, in 1961, and then she lost some of her speech. But she was alive for 18 years fighting this. She was not giving up. So she died at age 67 in 1971. Very short time. Uh, she did a story on a monastery, and she wrote her autobiography in 1963. But she, you know, once you've lost your balance, um, and probably there was some shaking, I would think. I, I, I know they don't have a cure, but things are a little better, I think, aren't they, for people? We're still at Model T days of brain research. I'm really? Afraid. Yeah. That's too bad. Anyway. Um, so, but there's so much to tell about her, but this is the generation, you know, who knows her. I mention it to so many people and they never heard of her. And that's the sad part, because she was colleague with all these famous people. Ansel Adams was a great friend of hers, and Alfred Eisenstadt and all, and um, they don't remember Margaret Mark White, so, yes. Did she ever go to Hollywood? No, no. She was all over the world, but not Hollywood. Erskine did. <laughs> he was getting remarried. He had, I think, four wives. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you mentioned her using a remote. Yes. She was, what is that? What was she using? What was she using? Oh, I don't know. I do. You do. You'd have a camera set up on a tripod if you had a cable oh, release. Right. So uh, you didn't have to be near. They wouldn't know where uh, you're pushing right. the button. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. A little, little plunger. Right. Thank you. Um, I have great stories about Margaret. People um, ask if, if others were jealous of her. There weren't too many women. Were the men jealous? I don't know. This, 
the truth was she got a lot of good stories because it turned out that she was becoming as famous as her pictures. You know, so some of them then. One time she was on the boat at the America's Cup and she came up to the railing of the press boat and got under one of the men and um, she fell in. But 20 years later at Cornell, uh, two men were talking and they said, you know that time she fell in? She didn't fall in. I pushed her in. <laughs> so that gives you a slight idea. Of some people might not have been happy about her. Um, but she, she was so dramatic, you know, that, I mean, they were wonderful photographers, all of those other people, but she knew how to bust her way in. Did you ever have any contact with Julie Riefenstahl? I don't know about that. I know who that is. I don't know. She, I'll tell you one thing. She didn't have any female friends, you know? She, this letter from Amelia Earhart is interesting because I don't see that they were really friends. I went to Syracuse University for my research and went through their 104 boxes, which I didn't go through all of them. But you don't see her having friends. She's busy being her career, looking out for her career. So I don't know about that. So her archives were Syracuse University? Yes, which is bizarre because I told you I didn't want to talk about those few years after her father died. Um, so she went to Columbia for her first year. Then she won a scholarship to the University of Michigan in herpetology, because that's what she was going to do. And then one of the professors said, no, you know, that's, you should be a photographer, because she was taking pictures and so on. But then she married a graduate student right away, first year. And um, he then went to Purdue. So they went to Purdue, and she took some classes there. Then she went to Case Western, and then, so she went to five colleges, but not Syracuse. So when I was there, I said, why did you, why do you have everything? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, in 1960s, when she's ill, they asked, they said they were putting together a manuscript division, and did she want to donate all her things? And she said yes. Mm -hmm. So the other schools didn't ask her. Yes. Did she ever encounter Amelia Earhart at Purdue, because Amelia Earhart was given a, a uh, program to lead up in women's, uh, to help women <coughs> in careers Interesting. at Purdue. I didn't see that. I didn't read about it. It's not in the autobiography or the biography, so I don't know. Maybe it wasn't quite the same time. Um, yes, there's a wonderful biography by Vicki Goldberg, who lives in New Hampshire somewhere. And um, so you have Margaret's autobiography and then the biography. They're a little different, which is the way things go. You know, you write your own story, and then someone else writes what really. <laughs> so I, I found that very fascinating. Yeah. One more question. Did uh, she ever want a Pulitzer Prize for her uh, No, she was one of the 10, no most influential women in America in 1936. Um, but no, I don't know. I mean, things were moving so fast then, and it was the Depression. I don't know. Do you know who won Pulitzer's for, for no photography idea. during that time? Yeah, well, I was in a program that had a Pulitzer winner just a week and a half ago. And this person said, it depends on who's on the jury that year. Uh -huh. And I said, the reason I won, I had a friendly jury that year. Yeah. They didn't think they'd done anything more extraordinary the previous year or that year, but they won that year. Yeah, but they had Alfred Eisenstein, Ansel Adams, and Dorothy Lange. I mean, they, that's only three of, of amazing photographers then, so. I saw a copy of her of the first Life magazine one time, and the pictures were there that she took in, in uh, Montana, on the region. Yeah. I don't see how anybody could. She yeah. loved to take those gigantic yeah. pictures, and she told people to print to black, which is what this is, so that you do not crop her picture. The only picture that's cropped is the first Life magazine picture because they had to cut it in half. It was the whole dam. It was too big. But um, 
she, she liked to compose her pictures, sometimes to kind of a dreadful extent, making people stand and stand and turn. And, you know, yeah. Did you have any contact in the Pacific with uh, Rosenthal or Iwo Jima Photography? No. No. You know, but that just brought me to the question. I always <laughs> love to see people in the audience when I mention um, Eisenhower's driver. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 People are always going, mm -hmm. <laughs> or when I say, you know, I took the shot and then I forgot to pull the slide, you can always hear the photographers who know, know what that is. But I don't know. So there are lots of other things I can tell you, but I don't want to hold you up here. Um, I can listen to all that. Well, yes. <laughs> right. Oh, well, there's no one else. Oh, yeah. Sally, I just want to say I think your investment in these prints is money well spent. Thank you. Yeah, I, I had to get the, the rights to these. Um, all right, let me see what I wanted to tell you. Oh, the speed graphic, by the way, that I have here. It's not the one, but that's the kind of shot that Joe Rosenthal used to do Iwo Jima, actually. Um, it currently resides at the George Eastman House. It has a 10-foot telephoto lens. So I wanted to find this picture, I mean this comment that's so great about her. This is, that's too bad. People tell me not to do this, it looks very unprofessional, but. Um, <laughs> um, well, one thing, she gave a speech, which I think is interesting, um, called Photography is a Woman's World Too. For a woman, the great stumbling block is marriage. <laughs> a husband and children always have a prior claim. The woman photojournalist should not have to go to her assignment with her thoughts torn between two interests, and she should on no account go to work with feelings of guilt. I didn't tell you what happened with that first marriage. Um, it lasted two years. It was a disaster, beginning with the mother-in-law joining them on their honeymoon. <laughs> this mother-in-law did not want her in her life. And so remember how Margaret's parents said, do it the hard way, do it perfection? She tried for two years, but it was hopeless. So she, that's why she ended up moving to Cornell. Now, she did not tell anybody that she was married, or that she was a divorcee, <coughs> or that when her father died, she learned she was Jewish. He had kept that completely out of their lives. He was not a practicing Jewish person at all her parents were into ethical culture. So she was keeping so many secrets. I mean, think of being Jewish and seeing Buchenwald and Stalin and, oh my gosh. Anyway, one man said about her, she, sh you should have been a press agent. You have such an eye for the dramatic, you know? <laughs> so uh, please come up and look at the pictures cl more closely if you'd like to. I know. Can I ask you one other question while yeah. you're looking? Yes. You mentioned about your uh, photos not, not being cropped. Did you, um, were you able to build that um, into your contracts, or did you have to argue that case by case? No, I, you, you know, I, 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 they sent these to me electronically. Then I had to uh, get them blown up and, and, pr and printed and mounted. It was quite an expensive deal. But the, but the irony is, I mean, they're on my computer. I, they're going to run out soon, actually. You know what? My, my question was actually aimed at the person you convincingly portrayed. I was really meaning to <laughs> oh, ask. Oh, oh, oh. Did, you were did, asking? Well, yes. I, 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 mm -hmm. Perhaps I misunderstood you, but did Margaret Burke White? She uh, was the one. Did she, did she uh, negotiate a contract to 
so that she had control over the composition when they were printed? Possibly, because she had a lot of power over the uh, over her uh, editors back home at Life, and first at Fortune, and then at Life. She drove her crazy, actually. <laughs> so she might have, yeah. Um, I'm just never going to find this one picture. I mean, this one. I don't want to quote it and get it wrong, but um, one man said, you know, she she was intelligent. She knew the story. That's why her pictures were so great, because you know she wasn't just taking the picture. But so were a lot of those other photographers too. I'm sure they were intelligent as well. But they have to be pictures like that. To understand that. Uh, tell, there is a great letter back there from Ansel Adams. He was a very good friend of her, invited her out to the West to <coughs> spend Christmas. Um, but he's explaining to her how to use a light meter. And she really needed help with all these technical things. She got help from people. It's a great letter. You have to read. Yes? What is the picture you haven't shown? Oh. <laughs> no wonder. <clears throat> No wonder. Oh, 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 how sad. I didn't say. I didn't bring it out. <laughs> so sorry. You know, this is what she created, the board packed in. These are the gates that go up and down. Oh. Isn't that bizarre? <laughs> Did you feel like, wait a minute. Where is it? <laughs> no, I was no, talking. No. <laughs> Some of you did. <laughs> anyway, yep, that was the inaugural picture, the inaugural cover of Life magazine. Wow. November 23, 1936. That's how important she was. Wow. Hmm. That's an astounding statement. Oh my gosh. That's sort of like everything in this show is happening again, though, isn't it? Yeah, that's what so we should get that feeling, but it's all happening again. <laughs> <laughs>